Good morning. Good morning. A very happy Easter to you as we come together to praise God on this Easter morning. I'm uh, Les Jessenus, I'm the minister here, and if you're visiting us for the first time, it's great to have you, but we hope very much that you'll uh, enjoy and enter into the joy and celebration of Easter this morning as we sing those songs of praise, as we bring those prayers to God, as we hear His Word, and also as we remember that life-giving death of Christ around the Lord's table as well this morning. The Apostle John, when in his later years he had the revelation of Jesus, when he saw him in his vision, he said this, Fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And again, Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And the second is like namely this, I shall love thy neighbour as thyself. 
There is none other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy on us, and write all these thy laws in our hearts, we beseech thee. The church's prayer, the collect for this time. Lord of all life and power, who through the mighty resurrection of your Son overcame the old order of sin and death to make all things new in him, grant that we, being dead to sin and alive to you, Jesus Christ may reign with him in glory, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be praise and honour, glory and might, now and in all eternity. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. God bless us all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Happy Easter to you all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Greetings to the members of Christ Church and any visiting um, visitors it's good to see you all on the whatsapp and it's good to get your messages have a great day have a great easter enjoy yourself in jesus name amen, amen. hallelujah christ is risen he is risen indeed hallelujah is taken from John 20 um, verse 1 to 18. The empty tomb. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been taken away from the entrance. She went running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and told them, they have taken the Lord from the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Then Peter and the other disciple went to the tomb. The two of them were running, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and saw the linen wrappings, but he did not go in. Behind him came Simon Peter, and he went straight into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth which had, been, which had been around Jesus' head. It was not lying with the linen wrappings, but it was rolled up by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. He saw and believed. They still did not understand the scripture, which said that he must rise from death. Then the disciples went back home. Mary stood crying outside the tomb. While she was still crying, she bent over and looked in the tomb and saw two angels there dressed in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been, one at the head and the other at the feet. Woman, why are you crying? They asked her. She answered, they have taken my Lord away and I do not know where they have put him. Then she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who is it that you are looking for? She thought he was the gardener, so she said to him, If you took him away, sir, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned towards him, and said in Hebrew, Rabboni, this means teacher, do not hold on to me, Jesus told her, because I have not yet gone back up to the Father, but go to my brothers and tell them that I am returning to him, who is my father and their father, my God and their God. So Mary Magdalene went and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and related to them what he had told her. This is the word of the Lord.
But that doesn't come from us. It comes from God himself. John's Gospel begins with Jesus at the very beginning. He is the pioneer. In the beginning was the Word. That is God. Jesus was there. He is the first. He is the, the pioneer of all things. He is the pioneer. He is God who took on flesh. Who took on our human flesh. That was a first. That was nobody else has ever done that. He is, as we remember this morning as well, he is the first to die and rise again into resurrection life. And that's what we're looking at. This is a pioneering moment. This is a huge moment, far greater than any of those man-made achievements. This is something which everybody needs to know about, which everybody needs to enter into. He is the first to die and rise again. And when the, John writes this resurrection account in John chapter 20, the way that he begins is that this is a pioneering age. This is a new age that is beginning. This isn't just another one of the Jewish celebrations that's been happening. This is something amazing that is happening for the first time in the world and you are entering into it. In the first verse of it, he begins, Now on that first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. So he's talking about a new age beginning, a new chapter in life beginning, a new perspective. So Easter is about a first in a huge sense that we are entering into something which has never happened before, in, into a new spiritual kind of continent. This is the entrance from the earthly life into the heavenly life, into the eternal life. Where God has said before of the first day of creation, this is the first day of the new creation that he is beginning, the new order of things. If um, you've been here with me and we've been following John's gospel through, through uh, since the beginning of the year, You'll remember that I said about how John uses contrast in writing. So he, he speaks about life and death. He speaks about darkness and light, about truth and lie. And you'll remember that when we looked at the story of Nicodemus, Nicodemus, um, John writes, went to meet with Jesus in the dark. But that, there was a double meaning to meet with Jesus in the dark. That not only that he went at night, but also he, he was in the dark himself. Nicodemus needed the light of the world, Jesus, to enlighten him. He was in the dark spiritually, even though he was this man who was so religiously, uh, had, had great religious knowledge. Where is the, the Samaritan woman at the, at the well? She meets Jesus in the brightest part of the day. And because she meets Jesus at the brightest part of the day, John is showing not only that she's meeting him at daytime, but that she can see and recognize Jesus. And that is a response that you see from, from the Samaritan woman. She recognizes Jesus immediately. Whereas to Nicodemus, it, it, he's not so sure, uh, even at the end of the conversation with Jesus. But the Samaritan woman, she's, she's clear about Jesus and she goes and tells other people in the village to come and follow him, to come and know and meet him. So there's darkness and light. And here again is that same thing. Well, John begins, when it was dark. And then when we think of the, the other accounts, it's about dawn, isn't it? It's about light breaking. So he is saying that Mary was in the dark spiritually. It wasn't just that it was, it was darkness and, and the morning hadn't broken through, that it was, it was, it was still needed, the, the dawn still, it wasn't the fact that the dawn was breaking, but it was, she was in the dark spiritually, as she, in her understanding about Jesus. It may have been dawn in terms of the, the time period, but she was in, that, in, that, in the dark, and so as, 
She comes to, to the tomb. It, it says it, it was dark for her. Now firstly, there is evidence. And that evidence is by the linen cloth. Evidence by the linen cloth, as well as other things. Well, she finds that the stone is rolled away when she goes to the tomb. And she sees that it's, the grave is empty. So she runs and she tells Simon Peter and the other disciple, who is John, the writer of this gospel, and they also come. And she, she, says, she says, they have taken the Lord from the tomb. We don't know where they have put him. Then Peter and the other disciple went to the tomb, and the two of them were running, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and reached the tomb first. Have the, oh, the next slide there. Now, there seems to be a lot of running. There's Mary who runs to the disciples, and the disciples who run to the tomb. And uh, one runs faster than the other. Well, obviously, there's the fisherman um, who's, who's Peter, and he, he's may, maybe had a few too many fish and chips suppers, because he, he's a bit delayed in getting to the tomb. But John gets to the tomb first, and as he's looking and examining the linen, Peter goes on in, and he sees the tomb that is empty. And John writes, that um, they see the linen cloths which were used to wrap Jesus' body and they still do not understand from scripture that he must rise from the dead. So from that evidence, from these first nine verses, what we're told is, is that there's still a mystery. They find the empty tomb, they find linen cloths, they find the body missing, but it is, they are not sure. So when we have a snapshot of what they have, what they see that morning, they are, they just don't know what's going on. It's not as they would have expected it. And they just can't piece the things together of what has happened. So there is, there is the, the body which is gone, the tomb is empty, but also the, the linen cloths are laid out separately. Now there is, there's a significance in the linen cloths, because John keeps referring to them. He keeps saying about these linen cloths. Verses 5 to 8 there. He bent over and saw the linen cloths, and went, did not go in. Behind them came Simon Peter, and he went straight into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there. And the cloth which had been around Jesus' head was not, it was not lying in the linen cloths, but was rolled up by itself. Now, um, a, a friend of mine who's a, a vicar some, somewhere else, he's, he's uh, done a nice little illustration uh, about this. So these linen cloths, there was this one linen cloth which, which would have been used around Jesus' body. And then there was another linen cloth which would have been used around Jesus' head. And uh, this is what um, Andrew Sack, the, uh, uh, my friend who's in Greenwich, he's, he's uh, traumatised for us. So he's laid out as, uh, as, as a body which, is, which has been laid, laid there. And he says, well, if, if it was uh, somebody who, who was changing their clothes and how they would take it off, it would be left in a pile like that. And I'm sorry that, that he's put down a teenager, but... But I'm sure it's not only teenagers, it's probably others as well who leave their clothes in a pile. But in the grave, it wasn't in a pile like that. He says it wasn't grave robbers, because grave robbers would have come and taken everything. They would, their, their reason is to, is to sell off things, to make money, that, so they would have taken anything of any little value. So it wasn't grave robbers because, because of what state was left, left in. But what he says is, is that just as it had been laid in the tomb, the cloths were all still there, but Jesus' body had passed through it, and it was just left as it was. 
It wasn't disturbed at all. The clothes that he had been, or the, or the binding that he had been put in, it was just laid there, and his body passed through it. And he was glorified and resurrected through through the, through those those clothes. The, the grave clothes could not hold him. The resurrection body. He broke through. He broke through that. And this is, this is so very different from how people sometimes read it, because they read it like it's a nice little um, laundry pile, that there were nice folded grave clothes that was left nice, neat, neat, neat and tidy like that. No, it wasn't like that. It was, it was just as Jesus had been bound and put in the tomb for burial, and he'd resurrected, glorified all the way through it, and it was left as it was, the head um, headpiece being separate to what the rest of, of the body, um, the body bindings. Well, this is very different to Lazarus, you remember from John chapter 11. Because Lazarus, he is just resuscitated, he's brought back to life as a physical, uh, in, in his physical person. So he comes round, he comes in out of the tomb, dressed like that, doesn't he? And, and Jesus, and Jesus, and they, and they say to him, uh, or Jesus says, he came out with his hands and his feet wrapped in grave cloths, with a cloth round his face. Untie him, said Jesus, and to let him go. So Lazarus was only just brought back to life from being a corpse, but Jesus was brought back to resurrection life. He was glorified. This is very different. And here. It, uh, when they see all of this, in, at the end of these nine verses, they just can't make sense because they've never faced anything like that. So they see the evidence, but they can't understand what is going on at all because they see these things and they record them for us, which is great. But, and they record it to tell us, to prove to us, this really happened. Jesus rose from the grave. He, um, he, he was, came out as a resurrection body. He didn't need, he didn't need the, the gravestone opened in order for him to come out. It was opened in order that the disciples could see that he had risen. He was already out of the tomb. Well, the second part of it in, that John shows us is that whilst Jesus was there, the second part of it is that uh, well, I really could do with a, a fork or a garden spade because it represents the gardener, the encounter that Mary has. The second part which John writes about. As the disciples, they, they, they can't see anything of interest, they're, they're not sure what, what's going on, they go back home. Um, Mary stayed at the tomb and she is crying, she is weeping. And there, as she peers into the tomb, as she looks in, because these, these tombs had small openings, but there were a large room inside, and as she looks in, now she sees two angels, one where Jesus' head was, and one in where his body was. And they say to her, why are you weeping? And she replies, they have taken away my Lord, I don't know where they've laid him. And as she then turns round from the tomb, she sees a man who she thinks is a gardener. And he says, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? And she replies, "If tell me if you, if you know where they've carried away the body. Now, she is in great grief to weep and grieve, especially at the loss of somebody that you know and have loved. It is something that we all do, and it's important that we show our emotion in that way. But here, as Mary grieves, as she cries um, outside that tomb, it's showing her love and devotion for her master, who she'd been following, her shepherd and her teacher, who she had been following the, those few years. <coughs> but in that grief, she still does not understand what is going on. She doesn't understand from the evidence. Her assumption 
is that somebody has taken the body, perhaps it's the religious leaders, perhaps it's the Romans, but somebody has taken it and moved it, perhaps for their own purposes, or the politics of the day. She doesn't understand. But Mary has asked the same question, both by Jesus and by the angels. Why are you weeping? Who is it that you're looking for? She's being asked twice in order to think again. Think again, Mary. What, what are you really looking for? Who is it that you really want? Now, when we face certain situations, we, even with our Christian faith, we might think that I know the answer. With our reasoning, with our understanding, with our belief, we, we might say, I know the answer to this. I know what um, should happen. But we can come to the wrong conclusion. Even though we can see the evidence, we can come to the wrong conclusion. And that's what Mary was doing. She was, um, if we carry on thinking in our, wrong, in our confusion, in our wrong understanding, that can lead to us being confused, lead to us in being in grief and sadness and loss and all of those things. But with Jesus, it doesn't work that way. When he brings this new Easter, this new order of things, even that which we think is done and dusted can be changed in the Lord Jesus. Even the worst, worst problem, the worst issue we face, the risen Saviour can change around the situation, can give us a different understanding, a different perspective than that human or earthly <coughs> reaction. Now even in that situation she couldn't see and recognise Jesus right standing there by, by her. And it's only when he calls out her name, Mary, that he rec she recognises it. It's, it's, it's those same words that Jesus said before, like it, the good shepherd, that uh, the sheep will hear my voice. They will respond to my voice. She saw, she heard his voice, and she believed. She turned towards him, it says, and said, Rabbi, don't help. And Jesus says, do not hold on to me, because I haven't returned to the Father. Now, because of this new order of things, it's no longer that we see Jesus as the earthly teacher or the moral person. We now see him as our Lord, our Saviour, our God. Easter is a new beginning, a new chapter, that this is the Son of God who died and rose again and who is glorified. So the belief in him changes. The belief in life and death changes. The belief in other things that uh, we uh, understand change in sin and judgment that changes because of the empty grave. All of those things are done and dusted. We can be sure of that. And we can be sure of, of his words. I am the resurrection and the life. We can know that that is so true. Now I wonder, as you thought of that, as you thought of um, some of the understanding and belief of Easter, whether that has been true for you, whether the risen Saviour has given you a new perspective, that you are sure that your sins are forgiven, that you are, are not fearful of death or judgment, because those are the things that the risen Saviour gives us. The encounter and the evidence, that is what changes our situation in order that we have this life in Him. Mary understands that for the first time now. She's brought into the light and she runs and she announces that good news to the other disciples. Now this is greater than going through the speed barrier, greater than anything that hum uh, human beings can ever do. This is God opening up the way for us to enter into that fullness of life, that relationship with Him. And it's for each one of us to accept that Christ died and rose again for us, for you and for me. We have to do that personally. And in doing that, we can be sure of our place in heaven, 
We can be sure that our sins are forgiven. We can be sure that death does not hold any bounds for us. Yes, our, we will decay, our body will decay and go down to the earth, but, but spiritually, our soul, that thing, our eternal life that God promises in Christ, we have that. We will be transformed, we will have that resurrection life with Him forever. And not only for us, for everyone who believes, our loved ones who believe, we can be united with them forever. If we think we have something of the best of the, the family life now, it will be far, far better. If, if we have it in Christ, we have so much more in Him. So is this a first for you? Have you entered into the new creation? Are you part of this new order of things? Are you sure your sins are forgiven? And have you entered into life knowing that you have a place in heaven opened by Jesus and what he's done for us? Let me pray. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Lord, we thank you that it's nothing of what we've done, but what you have done for us. Help us to know that with certainty. Help us to know that knowledge of this new life that everyone can enter into by what you've done for us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Peace be with you. Hallelujah. In response to the prayer, when you hear the word, hear us, please in the Lord, please respond our resurrection and our life. The response is our resurrection and our life. Let's pray. God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead, dead in transitions. It is by grace we have been saved. And God raised us up, Christ and seated as with him in the heavenly realm in Christ Jesus, that our risen Saviour may fill us with the joy of glorious and life-giving resurrection. Hear us, risen Lord. Oh, resurrection and our life. Christ is risen, and the power of his resurrection fills our world today with new life, hope, and expectations. Therefore, let us humbly bring our needs before him with thanksgiving. Lord, we pray for our dear church, our pastor and his family, our PCC members, wardens, newcomers and visitors, the worship team, Sunday school teachers, our children and young people, and all who attend our church, and all who attend our church events and celebrations. Lord, Help us to continue our service to you and honor you in, in everything we do. We pray for our church members who are sick and are unable to attend our church service, services. Lord, you made the blind to see, you made the limb to walk, you caused the deaf to hear, made the dumb to speak, and made the dead come to life again. You are unchanging God. And you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you, Lord, for touching our dear children with your mighty hand of healing and strength. Hear us, risen Lord. Our resurrection and your life. We pray that you, that you will guard and protect all those who are traveling during this Easter break, and that you may be with our young people and grant them wisdom and understanding as they prepare for their A-level and GCSE exams. We also pray for the contacts made through door-to-door -door visits and that you may help them grow and draw closer to the Lord. Lord, we pray for those living through difficult times such as famine and other natural calamities and for those without food and water. We pray that <coughs> We pray that you will also comfort those who have been bereaved, injured and displaced. We pray for this. We pray for wars and conflicts to cease. 
especially in Ukraine, Russia, Yemen, Syria, Ethiopia, and Sri Lanka. Please speak to the leaders of those nations, Lord, that they may choose peace and love. The recent Savior said, to, said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We pray for the global church and ask that you may be with those who are being persecuted for the faith in you, especially in the countries such as North Korea, China, India, Pakistan, and Nigeria. In the name of Jesus, we rebuke Satan's ambition not to spread the gospel. We therefore ask you, Lord. Jesus, we therefore ask the Lord Jesus that you may make us bolder and stronger to reach the world in your love and tell others about good news of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Here is the Lord. Our Lord resurrection and life. Amen. John 13, verse 34, 35, the new commandment. And now I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I've loved you, so you must love one another. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. Giving thanks. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy that sees beyond all faults and meets the needs of our people. Dear Lord, we pray that you have given and instructed us in your words to love. May we meet the needs of our people. Those less fortunate than us, may those in a position to help others do so with a willing heart, showing the expanse of your love. Use us, dear Lord, to help the homeless, those families suffering a low income, living in homes in and around our community, that are in bad condition, not fit to live in. Thanking those charities and volunteers, ordinary folks who supply food and clothing for refugees, widows, prisoners, and the needy. Bless those who mourn past their present. Be of comfort to those who have lost their ones. Eternal God, with the comfort of your love, that they may face each new day with hope and that nothing can destroy the good that has been given. May their memories become joyful, their days enriched with friendship, and their lives enriched by your love. Matthew 5, verse 9. Let's love the peacemaker, for they shall be called the sons of God. We pray that you make a way to find, to replenish countries and ravages by war and famine. Dear God, our world is broken and hurting. We pray for those who have lost loved ones since the war begun in Ukraine with Russia, destroying lives, hospitals, schools, and homes, and the continuations of the struggles in Syria, Iraq, and Iran, ongoing conflicts in many countries. By the power of your Holy Spirit, touch the hearts of the world, leaders to come to agreement for your perfect peace to reign. We pray for war to cease all over the world. Hear us, Mr. Lord. God's power is at work in us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which is exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead that he may reveal the light of his presence to the sick, the weak and the bereaved, to comfort and strengthen them. We especially remember those known to us and those who in our Christ Church family, Winston, Richard, Margaret and Mercy. We pray for the Lord, we pray, Lord, for their healing. Lord, those who are awaiting treatment, we pray that their appointment will be soon. We pray for those that are in pain, that they will be relieved. Jesus on the cross, you took our infirmities and our sicknesses, Matthew 8, 17. So Lord, we are looking for them to be brought back to full power. 
Lord, we thank you for our own health and those of our loved ones. We ask, Lord, that you'd keep us strong and healthy so that we can continue to work for your kingdom. In Jesus' name. resurrection in our life, that we may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible we may attain the resurrection from the dead. Merciful Father, accept his prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen.